talks on psychoanalysis shares topics published in the IPA Society Journals and Congress Debates Worldwide, brought you in the voices of the original authors. We hope this window will allow you to experience the depth and breadth of psychoanalytic thought around the world. This podcast has been created by Gaetano Pellegrini and edited by Gaetano Pellegrini and Andy Cohen. Introduction read by Andy Cohen. In this episode, Irini Rogero explores the development of the subjectivation process with the aim of demonstrating how adult analysis of adolescent problems that have not been worked through constitutes an essential condition for the reopening of an unfinished subjectivation process. The re-elaboration of the suspended adolescent dynamics in adulthood analysis reignites a process of spiral temporality, opening up the possibility of reconsidering both adolescent and childhood experiences in the double temporality established by psychoanalytic listening. Irene Ruggiero is a full member and training analyst of the Italian Psychoanalytical Society and of the International Psychoanalytical Association. She is Secretary of the National Commission for the Psychoanalysis of Children and Adolescents, former Scientific Secretary and President of the Psychoanalytic Centre of Bologna. She has actively participated in the scientific life of SPI, IPA and EPF and is the author of numerous publications in the most important Italian and foreign journals, as well as in collective volumes. Among her main areas of interest are the adolescence, the body and the analytical relationship. On these topics, she has recently edited two volumes with Anna Nicolò, La mente adolescente e il corpo ripudiato, and with Nicolino Rossi, La relazione analitica. Adolescent Dynamics in the Analysis of Adults and Reopening of the Process of Subjectivation by Irene Ruggero At the clinical level, more or less extensive limitations or distortions of the process of subjectivation in general terms, the progressive acquisition of the capacity to know oneself as a subject, agent of impulses, fantasies, affective states and personal thoughts, and to recognize others also as subjects, are present in a variety of pathological contexts. They appear, above all, in two types of psychic functioning, those characterized by decaphexis of the object, autistic or schizoid functioning, narcissistic patients, and those characterized by an intense use of splitting and projective mechanisms, above all borderline personality organizations. According to Caen, narcissistic disturbances and borderline organizations in adulthood result from an incomplete process of adolescent subjectivation. This thesis is shared by Novelletto, according to whom such incompleteness almost always presupposes an original difficulty in differentiating between the I and the other, an outcome of deficiencies experienced in the primary relations, above all those concerning the fundamental maternal functions of mirroring, word-bearer and anti-stimulus barrier. These primary deficiencies produce narcissistic flaws, which, becoming reactivated in adolescence, interfere with the developmental function of adolescence and produce stagnation or interruptions in the process of subjective appropriation of reality, starting with that of one's own sexed body. The idea I shall develop in this paper is that the analysis in adulthood of adolescent problems in the new posteriority offered by current analytic experience constitutes an essential condition for the reopening of a stranded or truncated process, a second opportunity which can bring to completion that which it has not been possible to work through during adolescence. It seems to me that, although adolescence today constitutes one of the most frequently travelled paths in psychoanalytic research, the adolescent dimension is still somewhat neglected in the analyses of adults. There exists, above all, among those who do not deal specifically with adolescence, a widespread conviction that adolescence plays a marginal role in the structuring of the adult personality, compared to the preeminent role exercised by infancy. Moreover, work in the sphere of adolescence is challenging in specific ways to the analyst, demanding a deep understanding of his or her own adolescence and the role it plays in his or her present life. The Undifferentiated Relational Matrix of Subjectivity 
The term subjectivation made its official appearance in 1991 in a work by Kahn, a paper aimed at integrating the Freudian metapsychology of the ego with subsequent contributions, principally those of Winnicott, on the function of maternal mirroring in the development of the sense of self. Kahn defines subjectivation as a movement which makes itself, starting from the other, a living, exclusive reality, and which deploys itself as such in its temporality precisely by starting from this founding identification. This assertion underlines the intersubjective nature of the process and the crucial role played by the object environment right from the beginning. Its roots go deeply into the infant's primary identifications, an area in which the pre-individual dimension of psychic functioning predominates, as identified by Freud, who hypothesized the possibility of direct psychic transmission from unconscious to unconscious. This dimension was developed by Winnicott, starting with the famous assertion that there is no such thing as a baby without a mother, and that the baby is at the same time confused with the mother, immersed in a pre-individual mental functioning, and bearer of a nascent subjectivity. Several authors believe that coexisting mental states are present from the start of life, some of which tend towards separateness, others towards fusion and assimilation with the other. Grotstein describes the existence of a dual track along which we can at any moment feel both separate and immersed in the pre-individual matrix without differentiation. Ambrosiano and Gaburi show how individual functioning oscillates between different dimensions of the mind, between movements of individuation and mass identifications. Russo draws attention to how the first nuclei of personal identity emerge from an originary undifferentiated relational matrix which persists through life as a basis for attraction and a possible residual mental function. With the concept of the interpsychic, Bolognini in his turn describes a physiological fusionality, a wideband functional level of high permeability shared by two psychic apparatuses. These mental states, in which a unison functioning dominates and in which the boundaries of personal subjectivity unravel, have relevance to communicative modalities based on the projective identification and direct communication that precede linguistic symbolization. So, it is at the dawn of psychic life, in the undifferentiated mother-infant matrix, that the process of subjectivation begins – starting with the infant's encounter with the mother's body and with her specific subjectivity. The process depends, from the start, on the mother's capacity for mirroring and attunement as the first subjectivating object. The most significant moments can be detected in the decisive turning points of development, principally during the second trimester of life. Beginning with the primary identifications, the mirroring process is started by the maternal gaze and the integration of aggression made possible by the object allowing itself to be used. In the Oedipal phases, with the fundamental passage to triangularity and the acquisition of a mental functioning which develops the earliest capacity for representing the mental processes of others and imagining their motivations, and in adolescence, when the individual finds him or herself exposed to the dilemma of choosing between subjective appropriation of the self and adhesion to alienating identifications. So the process of subjectivation develops in successive stages and deepens through the whole of life until the mind is able to function as a workshop in which we constantly repair. In every phase it passes through, it can become stranded in the most varied pathological configurations. But at every stage, especially in adolescence, the re-elaboration of prior experiences can restart the game and bring about varied developments, even of symptomatic solutions that have already been partially consolidated. It seems to me that compared to closely connected concepts such as those of differentiation, individuation or maturation, the concept of subjectivation is characterized by a specific link with awareness and the activity of self-representation.
It includes a specific reference to the progressive acquisition of the capacity to recognize oneself as a subject who experiences personal somatopsychic states. As such, it is intimately connected to the feeling of personal identity, which develops above all out of the secondary identifications and entails the experience of integration and the persistence in time of personal characteristics recognized as one's own. The ability to represent one's own mental processes constitutes a crucial element of this and is an integrating part of the definition Kahn gives it as a process of differentiation which allows us to represent ourselves as a representative activity. In this sense, it implies not only a sufficient maturation and differentiation, but also the fact of recognizing oneself and of feeling oneself recognized by others in one's own differentiated subjectivity. The role of the object in the process of subjectivation. Winnicott has taught us how development may not only be a question of growth, but may also presuppose a holding and sustaining environment, and how this may play a vital and indispensable function both in the constitution of the self and in its possible breakdowns. According to Kahn, the process of adolescent subjectivation implies two preliminary conditions. A well-functioning pre-conscious dependent on the quality of the primary object relations and the presence in the social group to which one belongs of values, especially paternal ones, law of the father, post-Oedipal superego. It requires on the one hand a good enough functioning of the transitional area and on the other a sufficiently solid consistency in the adult environment, thus both the maternal originary, raw sensory material, proto-emotions and the paternal limit triangulation and symbolic thought make their contribution to this. The process of adolescent subjectivation unfolds in an intersubjective space along two principal trajectories. On one side the psychic work of the adolescent engaged in a process of profound symbolic reconstruction of the representation of self beginning with the traumatic potential triggered by a bodily maturity which exceeds psychic maturity. On the other side, the subjectivating contribution of the object. The mother, accepting and transforming with her alpha function the unformed emotions that the infant communicates to her by means of projective identification, helps him or her to reintroject ameliorated emotions and contributes to the launching of a feeling of a containing interior, internal container, capable of working transformations. In carrying out this transformative function, the mother transmits both a method and elements of her own subjectivity. In fact, the modality in which she accepts, transforms and gives a name to raw bodily emotions transmitted by the infant is impregnated with her subjectivity and shaped by her relationship with her partner and with the important figures in her personal story, starting with her own parents, but they also bear traces of the child-rearing styles at work in the culture to which she belongs. Hence, the infant reintrojects emotion that has not only been ameliorated, but also marked by the mother's personal style, which is in turn amalgamated with the modalities prevalent in her group. The mother's response expresses both her empathic identification with her child and her experience of the world. Thus, what is reintrojected by the infant carries the trace of the object, as spring water contains traces of the various minerals it passes through. In their turn, the infant adds something of their own, of their nascent subjectivity, and thus a cycle of transformative micro-interactions is activated, marking both mother and infant with the subjectivity of the other. Likewise in adolescence, the need to represent somatic experiences psychically, which goes hand in hand with their subjective appropriation, requires, if it is to be performed adequately, the contribution of an object environment able to provide possibilities of mirroring and shared narratives. When things proceed well enough, the family group and its culture naturally and fluidly contribute to the constitution of personal identity, which is always also a group identity. 
In the contrary case, subjectivation can be obstructed by two kinds of factor, the extremes of which are represented on the one hand by the unravelling of the parent's authority as reference points for identity and by the consequent identificatory dispersion, and on the other hand by the imposition of excessively rigid and prescriptive models that block the personal exploration of the world and the acquisition of a subjective perspective on reality. The gap which exists between the needs of the adolescent and the responses from family and environment on the one hand transmits to him or her the modalities for understanding reality and of managing specific conflicts in the environment to which he or she belongs, while on the other hand stimulating him or her into a personal search that enables this gap to be overcome. So long as there is space, and so long as the environment does not mistake the vital search for personal solutions which the adolescent undertakes for destructive aggression to the vital search for personal solutions which the adolescent undertakes. If the object can accept the adolescent's personal gestures and words, even when they are discordant, as a vital contribution, if the needs of the object are not so preeminent that they fail to permit any play, then the adolescent will also be able to enjoy the pleasure of feeling different and of surprising the object, and in turn transforming it a little, his adolescence will constitute an opportunity for integration and of growth for the family and group as well. Otherwise, the adolescent risks staying trapped in alienating identifications with the objects, stuck inside a mental functioning saturated with affinities. The roads towards alterity and the unknown will be impassable, risking the breaking of primary identifications felt as vital links, or else crypts and protective bastions will be constructed, and certain areas of the mind will remain cut off. Or again, the adolescent will be compelled to destroy the identificatory objects, thereby losing the possibility of their symbolic representation and the opportunity for nurturing exchanges with the family and the group to which he or she belongs. Whatever the outcome, the objects will only be capable of being absorbed or rejected en bloc, and in either case will stay undigested. Disturbances of subjectivation are also partly caused by an excessive narcissistic cathexis and, at the same time, deficient mirroring on the part of parental objects who are themselves poorly subjectivized and therefore barely capable of a subjectivating function. Along with these disturbances, there is the inevitable establishment of narcissistic links which do not permit the enjoyment of that commensality which brings us to feel ourselves both a separate individual and at the same time a person who belongs to a family and a community founded on a history both personal and collective. The Process of Adolescent Subjectivation Kong defines the process of adolescent subjectivation as a process of differentiation, which starting with the inner demand to put one's own thoughts in order, permits one to appropriate a sexed body, to use one's own creative capacities, and to represent oneself as a representative activity. He then specifies that this process goes hand in hand with release from the power of the other and from the ability to enjoy it and starting from that with the transformation of the superego and the setting up of the ego ideal. The process of subjectivation is therefore intimately connected with that of differentiation. Creation of the self and differentiation from the object, birth of the subject and discovery of the object, are inescapably connected to the extent that the quality of the subjectivation also declines according to a scale of the object's possible otherness, that is, according to the subject's capacity for giving the other a place equal to oneself. Renegotiating the balance between the hope of a personal identity and adherence to the demands of the environment, avoiding the double risk of losing oneself in the other, pathological dependence on the object, or on the contrary of depriving oneself of its life-giving contribution to identity, avoidance of the object, represents a distinctive task for the adolescent. It puts before him or her a dilemma specifically connected to the narcissistic reshufflings which the adolescent process entails.
Therefore, the subjective appropriation of the self and the correlated capacity for depending in a mature manner on one's own love objects constitutes the outcome of a complex process which brings about the internal detachment from the parental models and their power by means of the subjective appropriation of the parents' values and support through the ego ideal and the assumption of responsibility for one's own experiences. Identity is constituted in the context of an unconscious narcissistic contract which pre-exists the individual and assigns him or her a place in the generational chain, guaranteeing the continuity of the group and the identificatory transmissions. In adolescence, together with the bodily transformations, this asymmetry constitutes a source of experiences of passivization. The deconstruction of the infantile identifications and the search for an authentic belonging to oneself opens up a potential conflict between a primary narcissistic contract connected to the bond between parent and child within a family and a secondary narcissistic contract which opens onto the level of social affiliation. Narcissistic intersubjective contracts, too evanescent in respect of their identificatory potential, expose the adolescent to the threat of loss of self through the lack of a symbolic framework which might support them in crossing the boundary which separates and simultaneously unites the symbolic order of the infantile world and that of adult subjectivity. Vice versa, excessively rigid narcissistic contracts interfere with the disentanglement from the parental imagos, trapping the adolescent in alienating identifications and in dimensions of the mind saturated by identifications with insufficiently developed ideals. The links lose their function of identity formation and of authentic exchange, degenerating into obstructive ties that encourage stagnation in narcissistic positions and compromise the possibility of a personal entry into the world of desire. It is in adolescence that the subject finds themselves confronted with the reality of an outcome different from what had been expected, with the inevitable gap between desire and reality exposed to the disturbing task of historicizing themselves, subjectively appropriating their own changes on the basis of what does not change in them. Adolescence, Terminable and Interminable It is largely the re-elaboration of infantile experiences in après coup which confer on infancy the meaning that it cannot have until the subject detaches him or herself on becoming adolescent. From this point of view, adolescence, insofar as it constitutes that inaugural detachment which gives an origin to the story and renders it representable, represents the very heart of the life of man. The psychic work of symbolically reconstructing the self-representations and integrating the new adolescent experiences – beginning with the new sensoriality triggered by the body's transformations, the familiar rendered alien by the pubertal transformations, makes adolescence the beating heart of the process of subjectivation. It is in fact the always open possibility of unmaking and refreshing links, the best and most specific one that the subject has inherited since adolescence, which constitute the vital source of the subject. It is therefore possible to think of adolescence not only as a specific moment of psychic growth activated by the pubertal transformations, but as an ever-active developmental structure, an enzyme, an organiser which brings potentially inexhaustible vital sap to the process of subjectivation. Understood in this way, adolescence constitutes a constantly working nucleus of the development of the self within a dialectic between change and persistence, between reactivation of previous links and creation of new ones. In this view, it does not denote a temporary phase in the life cycle, but a function of the mind that has to do with the intrinsic completeness of human development and its inexhaustible openness to experience an infinite dimension which nurtures the psychic reality of the adult and is beneficially reactivated whenever new experiences put the previous models into crisis, imposing transformations on identity, whenever mental attitudes rich in creative potentialities such as curiosity, openness to the unknown, doubt, 
the capacity to let oneself be surprised and availability to discovery prevail over repetition. Whenever complexity and the search for meaning and authenticity impose themselves on automatism and defensive rigidity. In this sense, there exists in adult psychic reality a tension about finishing adolescence without actually being finished with it, which represents the happy paradox of a terminated adolescence and a partly interminable adolescent labour. The analysis of the adolescent in the adult. A second opportunity. As is well known, adolescence does not always happen at the right time or produce adequate outcomes. It can be premature, delayed, blocked or even omitted altogether, stranding the process of subjectivation in a sort of stagnation in an interminable adolescence. Important pathologies of adulthood in particular borderline states and narcissistic disturbances, are also, besides the original deficiencies going back to the primary relationships and the first attempts at the constitution of the self, the outcome of difficulties specifically connected to the adolescent period. In the analysis of narcissistic and borderline patients, adolescence tends to be re-experienced rather than remembered. Massive adolescent problems burst into their analyses without warning, or modalities of mental functioning emerge which testify to the incompleteness and disharmony of a truncated adolescent process and are sometimes crystallised in character traits. Analysis of the relational modalities and the unresolved adolescent conflicts can represent a second opportunity for these patients, of great value for reactualizing, living and sometimes bringing to a conclusion a prematurely interrupted adolescence, avoiding the dual risk of an interminable adolescence and an interminable analysis. Even when the adolescent's difficulties take on the form of an Oedipal conflict, they refer to antecedent difficulties with identity, going back to the first phases of the constitution of the self. The violence which characterises the Oedipal revival in adolescence tends to lead towards the archaic. Given that the narcissistic transferences, so frequent in adolescent relationships, are transference with the originary omnipotent mother, their elaboration offers the potential for a transformation of the primary identifications, reactivated and repeated in adolescent relationships. Thus, the games are resumed. That which was left undeveloped in infancy is unveiled, along with proto-psychic elements inscribed in experience but not yet represented, or represented in too labile a manner, and now they can be integrated into a temporal sequence. The greater permeability between the psychic agencies and the possibility of cathexis onto the self, revived by the cathexis onto the analyst, sets in motion once again the possibility of subjectifying psychic elements that had not gained access to consciousness. Elements of that vast reservoir of potential emotions and thoughts which represent an inexhaustible fund of psychic expansion a supply of unformed and loosely sketched elements which will be able to acquire reality and psychic form by means of relational experiences which will encourage its representability and access to consciousness. This is not a matter of discovering or making conscious a repressed unconscious, but of finding and developing something that is pressing for existence. This is why the analysis of adolescence in an adult treatment is not simply a delayed or deferred action. To finish adolescence in an adult treatment is to experience and analyse whatever is most intimate in the difficulties of being. In other words, to bring the analytic work towards the most profound singularities of the psyche.